Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you where I want to go through all the best practices that you need to know for setting up efficient CICD pipelines. Now, if you don't know what CICD stands for, it stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. And it represents the set of processes that you design to enable frequent, reliable software releases, allowing your developers to push code independently go through automated checks and balances so that people can push code as quickly as they create it but without uh, you know any of the manual processes or errors that could typically result from that um, and two with the end goal of you know accelerating the time to market of your code um, and so there's two parts to this there's ci which is continuous integration and you know focuses on automatically building testing and validating code and then there's continuous deployment which is extends that and, autom and focuses on automatically deploying the validated changes to production environments. So actually bringing the code from you know, your backend repo from the developer into production. Um, so what I'm gonna focus on in this video is you know, some core principles, how you generally wanna design your pipeline, source code management, testing and deployment best practices and strategies, um, and you know, really how you can optimize and make your CIC pipelines as performant as possible. Uh, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot. But without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing I want to go through is just a couple of key principles that you should have in mind when you're designing your CIC pipelines. Number one, every step should be automated by default. You should only have manual interventions in exceptional cases if there's some kind of massive failure. They shouldn't be a routine process. And that means everything from code compilation to testing to security scanning deployment, rollback processes, all of those should be dictated by scripts that are all managed together programmatically. You should also make sure you have fast feedback loops. Um, and you can actually see that here where each step actually has a feedback loop where, you know, the second I deploy code and, you know, test it and build it, you know, I should get feedback from the build stage, feedback from the testing stage, feedback from the deployment stage, so that I can understand what's happening in each step of that pipeline to understand potentially where issues might be arising in my code, whether it's, hey, you know, maybe it builds fine, but it doesn't actually pass, you know, unit testing. That is really effective, you know, it's really important to have loops at every stage of the pipeline to feed that information back to the actual uh, code editor, you know, who's actually writing that code. And then also similarly, you know, kind of keeping with this as well is, you're gonna to wanna to design your pipeline to detect and report failures as early as possible. So that's why you wanna have these feedback loops here as well is, each stage should have a check to make sure, hey, if there's a failure here, don't go downstream, right? Stop this pipeline right now and tell the developer that, hey, there's something that's gone wrong, you need to go make some changes, right? And then order those pipeline stages by st speed and criticality where you're running you know, the quicker unit test before a slower integration test, right? Um, and then once an artifact is built, you wanna have, make sure you have immutable deployments of your code. So you know, if I'm testing a new piece of code in dev, uh, staging and production, that actual code, that artifact should stay the same through all those environments. And so make sure you're using the same binary or container image across development, staging and production environments and are only modifying configuration options so that you know if something works in dev, it's also gonna work in prod because there's no environmental changes. Um, and those are really, you know, kind of say the four core principles that you wanna keep in mind no matter how you're designing your pipelines and that are really just key to, you know, CICD in general. Next, I want to talk about some, you know, kind of architecture principles and, you know, how you really want to logically stage your pipeline. Um, and most CICD pipelines, you know, there are kind of sub-stages, but there are really four main stages and four main areas um, within your pipeline. There's going to be the source control integration, which is going to be figuring out, hey, how do I trigger on code commits, pull requests, schedule intervals to detect new code? have validated branch policies, merge requirements to make sure, hey, you know, code has to go through certain testing to go from dev to staging. And this is also where you're gonna be performing your initial code quality checks. This is your ingestion step. This is where you're getting code into your CICD pipeline. Then once your code's in your CICD pipeline, it's past some basic, you know, data qual or code quality checks. You're then going to have that source code actually get compiled and built, make sure all the dependencies resolve correctly. And then from there, with that compiled uh, you know, environment, you're then gonna run static analysis tools, create deployable artifacts to test it in actual you know, production light environments, um, and also start to generate build metadata and versioning. So you have versions of, hey, every time I create a new piece of code, 
or add something, it should create a new version so that if something goes wrong in that version or I want to revert back, I have that really tight and clean you know, version where I can hey, roll back these changes. Then once you've built you know, your new application, you've built the new you know, tool, whatever you are trying to deploy, you're then going to run tests against it. And here's where you're commonly going to be running things like unit tests with code coverage analysis, uh, performing integration tests against the actual services your code's interacting with, uh, running your code through security vulnerability scans, uh, and then also conducting performance load testing. Um, so you know, making sure that you know the piece of code you deployed can handle typical load conditions or you know spikes in perform in load without you know performance degradation. And then once your code is passed through those first three stages, you're then going to have the deploy step where you're deploying into staging environments, executing smoke tests and health checks to make sure that the deployment is going off healthily, um, and then from there deploying into production using the appropriate strategy there, and then verifying the deployment's uh, success after it's actually succeeded. And then through all of that, you're going to want to be you know, designing these pipelines to maximize parallel execution while respecting dependencies. So having things like independent test suites, multiple test environment deployments, and parallel security scans means that, hey, multiple people can deploy and test code in parallel without a typical bottleneck that might arise where, hey, you know, multiple people want to test code, but the environment's already taken up, so only one person can go at a time. That'll really slow down development, so it's important to have these strategies be developed in a way that can be parallelized. So now I want to kind of go into each of those stages specifically and talk about best practices from those stages. Um, so for source code management, the first thing you're going to want to think about is honestly implement choosing the branching strategy that supports your CI CD goals. Um, so typical approaches are things like, hey, Git flow, where you have release based workflows with separate development and master branches. You have feature branches for new functionality and release branches for pep preparation into, you know, incorporating into master branches. You also have GitHub Flow, which is a simpler approach that you just have a main branch and then a number of feature branches that represent new code that you're working on that can all be merged directly into main. And that's really ideal for you know more continuous, you know, quickly developed applications where you don't want to have, uh, you know, have code go through a number of steps to get into production. Um, and then you also can go through trunk-based deployment, and that is where developers work on short-lived branches or actually de directly on the main branch, what ena which enables rapid integration and deployment, but it can be a bit messy, if you, especially if you have a lot of different teams that are working together on it. Um, and then, you know, when you're committing during, you know, with these, you know, hey, I'm updating some new source code, you want to make sure you have very small focus commit commits with descriptive messages. So each commit should represent a logical change that can be easily understood and potentially reverted. And then, you know, you're going to want to use conventional commit formats to enable, you know, more automated change log generation and semantic versioning, especially with AI being able to process and do a lot of that for you now too. Um, and then finally, pull request workflows, you're going to want to establish a comprehensive pull request requirement. Make sure, hey, if someone wants to make a pull request and actually, you know, add something to the main branch, it's got to go through automated testing, it's got to go through code review approval, it's got to go through security scanning, and you can actually configure all these branch protection rules to prevent direct commits unless all those changes have undergone the proper validation. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the build stage and best practices for that stage. Um, and here, the most important thing is making sure you have reproducible builds that are deterministic. You should be depending dependency versions, so you know dependency doesn't change between different builds. Use very specific base images and control the build environments to make sure they are same across all the environments. And that'll help you make sure that you have reliable troubleshooting and consistent deployments as your code flows through your pipeline. You're also going to want to think about you know build optimization. Um, you know the common strategies for reducing build times if they start to spiral out of control are things like dependency caching, incremental builds, parallel compilation, um, and you know caching those frequently used dependencies and intermediate build artifacts, especially if they aren't being changed often, is really going to help you uh, avoid unnecessary recompilation and really decrease your build time. You also want to make sure you're you know, establishing artifact management, clear artifact naming conventions and retention policies. So storing things like build artifacts in your dedicated repositories with the proper metadata, you know, version, build timestamp, commit hash, test results, um, and then also implement automatic cleanup of old artifacts to manage those storage costs too. If you're supporting multiple architectures or platforms, designing your build process to handle those cross compilation efficiently is also going to be really, really important. Um, because you know, you're going to need to do things like matrix builds to test across different operating systems, runtime versions, hardware architectures, and make sure, you know, hey, I'm testing and deploying this you know, one build on many different pieces of hardware. 
Um, so just you know, making sure that's all managed properly is important to make sure you're actually getting the results you expect. Now, the next stage I wanna talk about is testing um, and talk about testing best practices. Um, and really what you wanna keep in mind is the test pyramid implementation where you follow this test pyramid principle where you have a very solid foundation of unit tests, fewer integration tests and minimal end-to-end -end tests where you're essentially, you, know, you want to have comprehensive coverage while also maintaining fast execution times. Um, and this is because you know, unit tests should comprise 70 to 80% of your test suite, focusing on you know, all the different individual functions and components in isolation to make sure, hey, this is the first thing I run and I can identify any components that might break really quickly because they're all being tested in parallel. Then the next step is integration testing, right? And this is where you're testing, hey, integration between components and external systems. And there, using test doubles or containers for external dependencies can help maintain test reliability and speed. The reason why you're not going to do as many of these if you're not you know, changing functionality for interacting with you know, an external service, or even if you are, you don't need to test every integration. You just need to test the one that's being changed. Um, and then end-to-end -end tests really only need to be run relatively sparingly, where you need to validate, hey, complete user workflows. I made a bunch of massive changes, or I'm just you know, launching my 1.0 version, where you want to focus on, you know, hey, critical business paths, happy path scenarios to make sure everything is, is running smoothly. Um, and then you're also going to want to make sure you're implementing strategies for actually managing testing data. Um, so you know, managing automated test data generation, database seeding scripts, data cleanup procedures, use things like you know, factories or builders to actually just create test data programmatically rather than relying on you know, one static piece of data set that you're using every time because you know, your code can almost learn that and you won't catch some errors if you're doing that. Um, and then make sure you also have a test environment management system so you can maintain isolated test environments for each pipeline execution to make sure you don't have you know, the testing of one feature interfere with the testing of another feature. And also you know, use containerization or infrastructure as code to take this even a step further to create ephemeral test environments that are quickly provisioned and destroyed as each new feature is deployed um, and tested and you know, moving through the pipeline. Now, the next thing I want to talk about are deployment strategies. And these are, you know, kind of the critical end line, you know, hey, you're at the end zone, how are we going to deploy our code? Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can do this. Um, first, and you know, something you might have actually already heard about is blue-green deployments, where you're essentially maintaining two identical production environments and switching traffic between them during deployments. So when I want to deploy new code, I keep blue as an active environment on that old version. And then I try deploying my code into green. And then once I verify that the green deployment works, then I switch all traffic into that green deployment. Um, and this approach enables you know, instant rollbacks and zero downtime deployments, but it's expensive. You have to you know, double the infrastructure resources and essentially build a copy of your application and then ever do that every time you're deploying new code. Um, also, another you know, kind of similar option, but not quite the same is Canary releases. I and mean, here you're gradually rolling out changes to a small percentage of users before full deployment. So here you, know, you say, hey, I'm gonna deploy this new app for you know, everyone in North America. Um, and you're, there you're gonna monitor you know, key metrics during that Canary phase and figure out, hey, is this working, is it not? And then automatically you know, pr either promoting that you know, new version to everyone else or rolling it back and going and sending, giving that small group back on the old version um, based on whether or not that was able to succeed. Then we also have rolling updates. Um, rolling updates are where you update an application gradually and replace old versions with new ones in batches. So it minimizes you know, resource requirements while maintaining service availability throughout the deployment process. Um, so it's kind of an even more extreme version of you know, Canary where, hey, I'm just actually gonna take each server step by step um, and, and switch them over. Um, and then there's also feature flag. Um, this is kind of the same as A-B testing in my mind where you have feature toggles to decouple code deployment from feature activation. So you know the code gets deployed, but then it actually doesn't get turned on unless that feature flag is turned on. Um, and that helps you, you know, do things like A-B testing and quick feature rollbacks where you know, hey, I'm gonna turn this on for a set of users, see how they, how they work with it. And then if it doesn't work out well, I'm gonna roll it back and deactivate that feature. Um, but you know, not necessarily need to make any additional code changes to revert that. Um, and that's really all I have for you today. You know, that's a really best practice for every step of your CI CD pipeline. Um, so I hope you've learned something in this video. I hope you've had, I hope you had a great day. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.